Watch this video if you want to see a big Russian Empire, which was possible if the Russians were competent in the First World War. This would be a tough task, as here is how most of the Russian soldiers were trained. Hey, Oleg, come here, blood. You're in the army now. But, but I have no training. Don't you worry, we'll give you everything that you need. A few minutes later. So, we don't have a rifle for you to train with. Just pretend like this broomstick is a rifle. What? The next day. Well, you have enough training. Here is a couple of bullets. Now, go and find a dead soldier. Take his rifle and use it just like how we told you. Suka blood! <laughs> this is no over exaggeration of how most Russian soldiers found their doom in the Great War, as this actually happened. I read it in this book regarding the October Revolution by Douglas Boyd, which has a large segment about the Great War. I'll be basing most of my sources on this book, so if something is wrong, make sure to tell Douglas Boyd, not me. The lack of training wasn't the only problem for the Russian army during the First World War. You may be surprised to hear of how incompetent the Russians and most importantly, Tsar Nikolaus II actually were. As a result, making Russia competent would be quite difficult, and we would need to change a lot for this to succeed, but it's still possible. Let's not forget that Russia lacked military victories, lost millions of men, suffered a famine, a provisional government, a communist revolution, and then a civil war. Fixing Russia and preventing these problems would be difficult, but I have enough information to give you a very plausible answer. I will go over the problems one by one, with a suggestion on how to fix them. By the end of this chapter, we should have a Russian beast, that would conquer the entire world, or half of the central powers at least. Let us see how a competent Russia would change the world war. The biggest challenge for the Russian country was Nicholas II, who you may know was very incompetent. But when you get into the details, it gets even worse. For example, this is how the Tsar lived in February 1917, before the February Revolution that put Alexander Kerensky and his provisional government in charge. Your Majesty, we have serious problems, society is collapsing, all the basic goods are crazy expensive, we're losing the war and Oleg had to sell his wife to afford food. You need to install constitutional monarchy. Oh hey, look what I found, it's dominoes. You need to put two of these black dots to border each other and go as long as you can. But your majesty, we need your help to fix the country. I'll join you later, I'm more interested in dominoes rather than the ongoing war where we're losing millions of men. This is just how uninterested Nicholas II was in ruling the country, but it's even worse when in 1905 there was a mass revolution as a result of Russia losing their war against Japan. Nicholas II refused to establish a constitutional monarchy. He created something like a parliament that can vote and approve laws, but he didn't have any legislative rights. So the Tsar wanted to rule but did a terrible job doing so, which means that I think it's the best for all of Russia for the country to become a constitutional monarchy in 1905. Come here, my nephew Nicholas II, listen, you need to liberalize the country or I'll blow my brain in front of you. As a result, Nicholas II promised to reform, but never followed up on most of his promises, as it was just empty words to appease the masses and gain time. In this alternate history, I would change this, so Russia would become a constitutional monarchy. The Tsar would only appear as a figurehead and have some limited power, which is good as his father didn't teach him on how to rule the country, but also Nicholas II never got any good education. This would also prevent Rasputin from calling many of the shots in Russia, but many don't know how this was even possible. Rasputin was calling the shots in Russia because Nicholas II decided to consult with his wife instead of with his ministers regarding the matters of the country. Rasputin and his wife were very close, so his wife often asked Rasputin for advice. With Tsar's limited power, this will not happen. Another thing that would get prevented is for Nicholas II to directly assume control of the army in late 1915, as this time he wouldn't be allowed to by the constitution. Now we have fixed just one problem, but if the Great War starts the same way, politically Russia may avoid the famine that caused the Bolsheviks to rise and succeed, but the military situation hasn't improved one bit. While Russia becoming a constitutional monarchy is more straightforward, to improve the military situation is more difficult, but I have a really good suggestion. Let me introduce you the Russian plans for the Great War. Plan 19A were to be applied if Austria-Hungary was the largest threat, and 19G if it was the Germans. These plans were the equivalent of the German Schlieffen plan, which is the most famous one. In case of 19A, Russia would station a large army in southern Poland, 
where they would fight the weaker Austro-Hungarian army, occupy Galicia and then the Carpathian Mountains, then go into the Hungarian plains and capture Budapest. According to this plan, there needs to be just enough Russian soldiers to hold out the front lines against Germany. This plan was partially applied, as you may know that Russia captured parts of Galicia, but never crossed the Carpathian Mountains and captured Budapest. This is because on the Western Front line, the French could have lost Paris as a result of the Schlieffen plan, so they requested Russia to attack the German divisions in East Prussia, as to ease pressure off from France. As a result, instead of doing either plan 19A or 19G, Russia did both plans, which split their attention and resources, and made sure that they don't succeed in any of them. 19A could have succeeded against Austria, and the book mentions how Budapest could have been captured, but I'll explore this scenario later. For now, all you need to know is that the Russian military high command was somewhat incompetent, and let me tell you how their offense into East Prussia went. The Russians planned to do an encirclement of the German divisions in East Prussia, where the Russian army, stationed in Vilnius, led by Paul René Kamp, needs to attack East, so they can meet with the army of Alexander Samsonov, who would attack north of Warsaw. Such pincer movements that are over 100 km long require exact geographic coordination and a strict timeline. The problem is that Russia was living in the previous century, and their radio communications were decrypted, so the Germans could tune in and know about these plans in advance. The two Russian generals in that case also had no communications between each other, as they refused to speak to one another. A siege was blamed for Russia's loss in the Russo-Japanese War of 1905, which was 9 years ago. This is why the communication between the two generals, who needed exact communication and coordination in order to succeed, was not done between the two of them, but they had to use a third party, which is the Stavka in Petrograd, which had Germans listening to it. As a result, the Germans knew about the Russian offensive even before the Russian ally of France knew about it, so it's no surprise that this offensive went terribly for the Russians. After the Battle of Tannenberg and the catastrophic Russian losses, the Russian general Alexander Samsonov decided to put an end to his life. To resolve this problem, I think that simply not putting these two military commanders along the same front line would be an improvement for the Russian military situation. This was the Russian military situation in the macro, but on the micro it was even worse. Despite the poor training I mentioned in the beginning of the video, Russia was using a mixture of domestic, American, Japanese and British rifles. Each one of them used different ammunitions to fire, so in many scenarios soldiers had rifles and ammunition but they couldn't use them to fire. One soldier wrote in his memoir that in a box of 30,000 artillery shells, only 200 of them were operational, so only 0.67% of the artillery shells worked as intended, which is truly a terrible rate. Earlier industrialization seems to be beneficial to Russia, as this would have allowed for them to build domestic factories, which would have resulted in them to have single rifles and ammunition. As a result, this would benefit the war situation greatly. If this is done, the Russian railways could also be improved, which they were left underdeveloped in Poland on purpose. This is because it would make it for an advancing army more difficult to move deep into Russia, but on the contrary, it made it difficult for Russia to move soldiers and supplies there quickly. The more likely outcome is that Russia at least purchases equipment from one single country, as domestic production would only fix the problem if you take corruption out of the equation. Let us not forget that due to corruption, at least half of the produced rifles would disappear somewhere, which can make sure that the future revolution is even more deadly. I say that it's better for Russia to purchase weapons and ammunition from one single country, while they produce heavy equipment in their own factories. Either way, a lot more weapons are needed, as Russia had 5 million mobilized soldiers and only 1.9 million rifles, so one in every two soldiers had a weapon, the rest were cannon fodder. The soldiers didn't use radio, but had horsemen to deliver information. Even worse as a lack of railroads in the fronts against Austria, Hungary and Germany, the soldiers had to march hundreds of kilometers, after which they were given no rest and were supposed to fight in a battle right away. Here is a joke that the Russian soldiers told to each other during the war. We will retreat to the Ural Mountains. When we get there, the amount of the enemy would be reduced to one German and one Austrian soldier. The Austrian, as per their tradition, would surrender, and we will kill the German. Honestly, this was a solid strategy. It worked well for the Russians in the Second World War. Russia needs to improve its war mentality, which can happen if Alexei Brusilov had more power, maybe even be assigned as the military general of the country. He was caught in a retrospect by Sir Bernard Montgomery as the only competent Russian general during the First World War. In the book, it says that he was capable to cross the Carpathian Mountains and capture Hungary, but the other military generals on his flank refused to support him. 
For example, the Russian general Alexei Avert postponed his advance to support Brusilov, as he claimed that there was bad weather. Tsar Nicholas II agreed to postpone the advance into Austria-Hungary, which of course was a mistake. This time the Tsar wouldn't have this much power, but Brusilov has more power, which should result in a more competent Russia militarily and economically. The final problem was that the Russian soldiers were comprised of about 75% illiterate peasants, which are numerous but do not make for good soldiers. When Russia had to retreat, it was worn down by the army, looting its own villages and stealing the livestock. On the other hand, the lack of peasants created a famine back home, so this can be prevented with a more effective mobilization effort. Hey, I'd like to purchase one loaf of bread. Sir, that would be a million rubles. Wait, it's 1914, not 2024. Are we getting sanctioned? No, it's expensive because all the farmers are fighting on the front lines. There is no food left in Russia. Suka blat! We turned Russia from a backward society that would lose on every single front it fought in, while also suffering a famine to a more competent Russian empire. I know the backstory was quite long, but I hope this answer on how to improve Russia satisfies you more than just industrialize early. This time, Russia is better prepared for the conflict, so when the events of 1914 unfold, Russia can go through with their plan of 19A, which aimed to capture Budapest. In the book, it was mentioned several times that such an invasion could have worked, had the surrounding officers supported Alexei Brusilov. This Brusilov offensive actually happened historically on the 4th of June to 20th of September 1916, but it could have started in the beginning of the conflict, so almost two years earlier. This is considering that all I said was implemented. Considering how fast and easy Austria-Hungary was parts of Galicia in 1914, the Brusilov offensive, had it happened two years earlier, really has a chance to reach the Hungarian capital of Budapest. This can potentially knock Austria-Hungary out of the war, before Serbia has even capitulated, and Bulgaria, the Ottoman Empire and Italy have joined the conflict. If this were to happen, we would have a shorter war, which would result in a mild peace treaty. I will tell you how this peace treaty would go, and later I would explore total war, where the conflict lasts a couple of years, which is a real possibility. So, if there is a short war and Russia manages to secure a victory, the Russians would gain some German bordering provinces, but also the entirety of Galicia. Serbia would get Bosnia and France would gain alsace lorraine Germany could lose a bit of colonies, but not all of them. Finally, Charles I, who was a liberal king, would be put in charge of Austria-Hungary, hopefully liberalizing the country and creating a Slavic crown. But you may be wondering why the fall of Budapest would result in Austria-Hungary to surrender. This is because the Hungarian portion of the empire would feel threatened and most likely rebel against Austrian rule. As a result, Austria can surrender and lose Galicia and Bosnia, but keep Hungary. All I just mentioned is very optimistic, but it's possible if Russia industrialized earlier and had a competent military. Some cases say that Germany will not declare war on Russia if the country is too strong, which I think is true. However, this doesn't stop Russia from just joining the war, so Germany is really screwed in this scenario. The most realistic option is that Russia just hold the front lines in the beginning, and when France requests help as to ease pressure of Paris, the Russians would attack East Prussia instead of Galicia. This means doing Plan 19G instead of Plan 19A, but it's important not to do both at the same time. Earlier I mentioned the plan to encircle East Prussia, which this time would be possible with a strict schedule, better communication and decrypted radio. I have no doubt that this would catch the Germans off guard, so it's possible for East Prussia to get encircled. If you know your geography, you will know that Königsberg exists, which is a major port city, so the German army can be supplied via the Baltic Sea. The Russian navy can be used to blockade this, but considering how unwilling both sides were to use their battleships in a war due to the high cost of building, maybe the Russians allow the Germans to resupply the region. Either way, I assume that it would become very expensive for Germany and it would require soldiers to move from the Western Front to the Eastern one, actually alleviating pressure away from France. If you want to be even more optimistic, in the book it mentions that the Schlieffen plan was not followed thoroughly, and if it was, Paris could have fallen. I mentioned this because the Germans didn't protect their right flank, which historically didn't see any problem, but this time with a weaker Germany and a stronger France, an encirclement in Belgium is possible. This can force Germany to pull out of Belgium and station their troops west of the Maas River, which would be another disastrous defeat. Just for the sake of this video, I will not go through with this option, because it would make for a more boring scenario, and I want to have an exciting war. As a result, on the Western Front it would be all the same, but on the East, instead of Russia capturing Galicia, they would have captured East Prussia. 
This is not too big of a difference, which would mean that Bulgaria and the Ottoman Empire still joined the war on the side of the Central Powers. Again, if Germany were to get encircled in Belgium, I don't think the war would escalate to include more countries. Which is the opposite of what I want, as this makes for a quick war, resulting in a boring video. Plus, I already told you what the peace treaty would look like in a case of a quick war. Still, with the expansion of the Central Powers, Italy and Japan would join the Entente, and Romania would do the same after the Russian offensive into Galicia, which is the Brusio offensive. This time it would take place at the same time, in mid-1916, but it would succeed even more, opening the way towards the Hungarian plains. This would scare Hungary, as they fear they can lose Transylvania and Slovakia, but also their Western Balkan holdings. As a result, the country needs to negotiate with Entente regarding a future peace treaty, as the Hungarians would be looking to abandon Austria. With the capture of Hungary, exactly this would happen, but the country would still lose out of territories after the war. Serbia would reform Yugoslavia, so Hungary cannot keep their access to the sea, but would keep Vojvodina and Northern Transylvania, plus the entirety of Slovakia and Carpathian Rutinia. Now, you may say that Russia wants to protect the Slavic people, so giving these Slavic lands to Hungary is close to impossible. But stick with the idea, I have something interesting coming up. The Hungarians would need to take this deal, considering that the Russian soldiers currently occupy their capital. The Russians would also promise the Hungarians Flume, which would be officially in the Kingdom of Yugoslavia, but be technically operated by Hungary. A railroad would link Flume to Budapest, so Hungary would still technically have access to the sea and to world trade. Again, you may say that this is a bit absurd, but I would say that this is possible, let me explain. I think it's really likely for Hungary to keep their panhandle and access to the sea. This is because if Russia has good relations with Hungary and allow them to keep out of their former territory, the Hungarians can allow Russia access to the Mediterranean Sea, which has been a great goal of Russia for several centuries. Russia was blockaded from accessing this body of water from the Bosphorus Straits, and even Denmark blockaded Russia access outside of the Baltic Sea. If Russia supports Hungary, they can gain access to the world's oceans, which is really valuable. On the other hand, Russia can push for Constantinople, but I don't think that the United Kingdom would allow them to do that, at most an international zone would be set up in the Straits. So this is why it's so important for Russia to secure Hungary as an ally. So considering this, Russia doesn't have to commit so much more to the Ottoman Empire. But they would still liberate Ottoman Armenia, which I bet they would keep after the war. Russia is unlikely to keep the Bosphorus Straits either way, even if they commit a lot to defeating the Ottoman Empire, as Britain and France would just checkmate the Russians. Eventually, Hungary would switch sides, before the fall of Serbia. As a result, Austria would also capitulate, as the situation was getting out of hand. Once Austria-Hungary is out of the war, it's safe to say that Germany has no chance of victory, but I don't see them surrendering right away. Germany would move into Austria and annex the country, together with other German minority regions of the former Austro-Hungarian Empire. This would only prolong the German struggle, and unless there is a separate peace deal with the Russians, there is no chance that Germany wins this conflict, even worse, coming out as a single country in the peace treaty. With the eventual German surrender, they would have similar peace treaty, but I assume that France would directly annex the Saarland, but this time occupy the Rhineland instead. This is possible because the United States of America never joined this conflict, due to the war being slightly shorter, so the idea of self-determination is not introduced in Europe, hence why the Hungarian access to the sea is possible. Serbia would still double their territory, and despite them not forming Yugoslavia fully, I think that the nation would still be content with its received territories. Italy would also be awarded their parts of the Dalmatia most likely, so there's not going to be a bold man in Italy this time. Czechia would be called Bohemia Moravia, and is likely to become a kingdom, ruled by a Russian nobleman. Since Germany would become a democratic republic, Russia can install a king in East Prussia, again puppeting the region rather than to annex it. Russia would also take the Polish majority regions in Germany. Since Germany tried to unite with Austria, I think it's more than likely for Germany to be slightly broken up, as Bavaria and other minor German states would be allowed to break free. As a result, the Austrian painter cannot rise to power in Germany, but the communists are likely to take over in Germany. This is perhaps a more peaceful world, as there are no ultranationalists in Italy and Germany, but also in Japan, who borrow this ideology from Italy. Germany might go communist, but they would be too weak to unite the German states in the first place, so them starting a world war I think is not possible. While there are still some tensions in the Balkans, I think that this peace treaty would prevent the Second World War, or a similar conflict, so we would have a longer period of peace. 
of this happened because Russia performed well in the Great War. But I suggest you try to win this war as Germany, where in this interactive video you can take charge of the country and try to make them win. I hope to see you there.